Brother Andrew is going to come and talk to us concerning the Lord's Supper. Well, good morning. As we get ready for communion, uh, I've got a couple thoughts for us this morning to ponder on, uh, on love. And I'd like to read a little scripture for us. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 says this. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I think we could use a little more love in today's world right now. Love is a beautiful thing. It's something that we Christians are supposed to be known for. In fact, Jesus tells us that in John 13, 35. I got the wrong scripture there. John 13, 35. There we go. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus calls us to be set apart from others because of our love and how much we love each other. You know, we all have people in this life that love us, and we love other people. Uh, If you were to ask me who in this life loved me the most, I'd probably say my mother because she's obligated to do that. But, uh, (laughs) you know, to, to help us understand and comprehend the depths of God's love, though, You know, even though, you know, my mother loves me a lot, it's not as much as Jesus loves me. Jesus still loves me more, uh, just to help you understand the depth of that. And, you know, Jesus loved us before we were us. Thousands of years ago, Jesus set out on this world. He had a plan. He came to this earth, and he died for us. That was his one purpose, was to die for you individually, every single one of us. He was thinking about us. John 15, 13, that was the verse I had earlier says this, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. And that should sound familiar this morning. You know, Jesus loved you more than you can comprehend, more than a friend's love, more than a brother's love, more than a mother's love. And that's why we do this this morning, because he loved us so much that he laid down his life, his body was broken, his blood was shed, and he had you on his mind. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come back out to your house, Lord, to worship you this morning. I, we appreciate that, and we're thankful for it. And Father, as we set this table, Lord, help us to remember what you did for us. Help us to remember the depth of your love and how much, how much love it must have took to take those nails on that cross and how much love that it must have took to, to go through the suffering and the pain and the anguish, Lord. We know that you love us, and we appreciate that. Father, help us to go out of this place and help us to remember that you know, we have to carry our cross every day. We have to take, up, take it up and follow you. And, Father, help us to be good examples and a light in this dark world, Lord, and help us to represent you and stand up for you. It's all these things I ask in your name. Amen. Once again, I do want to welcome everyone out that's visiting with us. And if you are a visitor, and just know that we'd love to have you at the Rice Station Christian Church each and every week. We want you to come and praise God with us and want to welcome out our church family that's here every week as well. If the Lord allows, today we're going to continue our sermon series called The Moral of the Story. And just as a reminder, uh, this series is based on the parables of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And a parable, if you remember, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Or in other words, an 
earthly story with a deep spiritual meaning that Jesus gives us to help us grow in the faith. When I was 12 years old, my father was really sick with heart disease, and I've shared that with you before. But when I was 12 years old, my dad spent long stints of time in the hospital. And sometimes my mother, because she had two other smaller children, she couldn't stay there. So I got to stay with dad in the hospital, sometimes for two and three weeks at a time. And I tell you what, something that I got to do in the hospital will see all kinds of people, meet all kinds of people in the cardiac wing of UK Hospital. And I, I remember meeting some people who were sick uh, with rejection from their heart transplant. I met some people who were needing a heart transplant. I met some people who were too weak to have a heart transplant, so they were trying to build up their strength. And there's one specific lady that I remember meeting in the hospital. And she would always push this really big, I mean, it was like this big, this big brown box up and down the hallway. This brown box would remind you of a walker that was boxed in because it was on wheels. She would push that box up and down the hallway. She would push that box down to the cafeteria. She would push that box outside and sit on the benches outside. So as a 12-year-old boy, I got very interested in why she was always pushing around this big brown box. So one day my curiosity got the best of me. And I went down the hallway, and she was walking down the hallway, and I said, ma'am, and she was an older lady, I said, ma'am, why are you always pushing around that big brown box? I couldn't figure it out. So then she explained to me that that big brown box that she was pushing around was actually her heart that that big brown box was pumping the blood for her through her system. It's something called a heart mate. Now, nowadays, you can have a heart mate that's on a little thing that you can put on your side. But this was before they came up with that. And she explained to me that without that big heart mate box, that she would die. That she was trying to get strong enough to have a heart transplant and to be put on the transplant list. This lady desperately needed a heart transplant. And you know what? There are a lot of people in the world today who need a heart transplant, spiritually speaking. That being said, the parable that we're going to look at today and the moral of the story is one that I like to call the parable of the heart conditions. Now what it's most commonly called is the parable of the sower. And it's found in Matthew chapter 13. So I would encourage everyone to get out your Bibles or get out your Bible apps and go with me to Matthew chapter 13. Of course, the Scriptures will be on the screen, but it's always good to get out the Scriptures and dive into the Word of God so that we can continue to grow in the Word. So Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, says this. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. So these big crowds are gathering to listen to Jesus, and the crowd is so big that Jesus decides to use a boat as his pulpit. Okay? So verse 3 says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up because the soil was shallow. Uh, but while the, when the sun came up, the, plant, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plant. Still others fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. And then Jesus says this, He who has an ear, let him hear. And he says that because he's saying, This lesson that I'm teaching you right here is very important. So if you have an ear, pay attention to what I'm telling you. Now, in this parable, it's important for us to know that the sower is us Christians. We are to be going out into the mission field of this world, and we are to be scattering the seed, which is the Word of God, 
to all the people that we come into contact with. And the soil is the heart of man. And the heart of man can either be receptive to the Word of God or not receptive to the Word of God. So as we go through this message today, ask yourself this question. What kind of condition is my heart in, spiritually speaking? What kind of condition is your heart in, spiritually speaking? Let's now examine these different soils or these different heart conditions. First off, some people have the pathway heart condition. The pathway heart condition. If you notice back in our text in verse 3 that Jesus said that some of the seed fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Now, when I was growing up in deep eastern Kentucky, we would play a whole lot in the mountains. And you usually knew where to walk when you were in the mountains because people would hike so much through the mountains that there were little paths leading everywhere. And if you were to get down and feel of these paths, these paths were solid. They were hard. They'd been packed down by all the hiking that people did. And that's the way it is with some people in this world today. Because of the accumulation of all the sin and evil and wickedness and hatred and worldly desire, people can develop a hard heart. Just like that path that was beat down by all the walking. People can develop a hard heart. And a person's heart can be so hard that they will not understand the Word of God. So when the seed of the Word of God falls on their heart, or when they hear the Word of God, it will not penetrate their heart. Let's look at how Jesus explains this, if you would. Let's look back there in Matthew 13 and go to verses 18 through 19. There the Scriptures say, Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. Let's stop there for just a second. This is one of the very few parables that Jesus stops and explains. Why? Because when we study the Scripture through the guidance of the blessed Holy Spirit, the Lord helps us understand the parables by spiritual perception. But He takes time to explain this parable to us. And verse 19 says, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, that's talking about the church, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed that fell along the path. The word doesn't penetrate that person's heart, so Satan comes along and he snatches it away. You see, Satan knows how powerful that the word of God is. The word of God is so powerful that it has changed so many lives. All of us who are Christians here today can say that the word of God changed my life. Amen? You see, the Word of God is so powerful that it has changed millions of people's lives throughout the years, and Satan knows that, so he's always ready and willing to snatch the Word or snatch the seed from the heart of a would-be convert. We see this happen to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. Just to remind you what happens there, the Apostle Paul is on his way. He's trying his best to get... to Rome, to preach the word of God there. And he gets to stand before King Agrippa. And when he's standing before King Agrippa, as all of us Christians should do, he preached the word of God. He told King Agrippa about Jesus. He shared with Agrippa part of his testimony. And then look at what Agrippa says in Acts 26 and verse 28. There it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Agrippa's response reveals his hard heart. His response reveals his pathway heart condition. And sadly, the Scriptures give us no indication that he ever obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. So ask yourself, Do I have or do you have the pathway heart condition? Do you have a hard heart? Is your heart always hard towards your fellow man? Is your heart hard toward the message of the word of God that's being spoken to you today? Do you have the pathway heart condition? Or do you have 
the rocky heart condition. The rocky heart condition. I'm sure we've all been out in nature before and we have came across a rock and that rock has a flower blooming out of some dirt on the rock. But the thing about it is is that flower is not going to last very long because it can't dig its roots down into that rock and receive nutrients so that flower is soon going to die. And that's the way it is with the rocky heart condition. When someone has this rocky heart condition that Jesus is talking about in this parable, they have received the Word of God. They have obeyed God's plan of salvation, but they quickly fell away. We all know people like that. They've come to church. They've heard the Word of God. They were cut to their heart about Jesus. They were baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't take too long, and they fall away from the Lord. But let's see what Jesus says about this. Back in our text of Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verses 20 through 21. There Jesus says, The one who received the seed that fell on the rocky place is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. That's coming to Christ and having the joy of salvation. But since he has no root... He lasts only a short time when trouble or persecution comes because of the word. He quickly falls away. Jesus is saying the person with the rocky heart condition, well, they come to Christ and they're all fired up for the Lord and they think that being a Christian is all sunshine and rainbows. But the fact of the matter is, being a Christian isn't all sunshine and rainbows. The Bible never tells us that being a Christian is easy. As a matter of fact, the Scriptures tell us that the exact opposite is true. Christians and non-Christians, I'll tell you this today, being a Christian, serving Christ is hard. It's not easy in a world full of sin and evil and wickedness. And we see that every day, don't we? Sin and evil and wickedness. I mean, just watch the news or open up a newspaper. You're hearing all kinds of evil things. And being a Christian through all that is hard. Jesus said that foxes have holes, that the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He's saying, follow me? Yeah, it's going to be difficult. In Revelation chapter 2, in verse 10, Jesus is talking to the church at Smyrna. And let's look at what he says here to them. He says, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you'll suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I'll give you the crown of life. Doesn't that sound hard? That's difficult. Now besides this, time and time again throughout the scriptures, we're told that we're going to have tribulation, that we're going to have trials, that we're going to have suffering, that we're going to have temptation. It makes me think of the old Christian song that says, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. When we sing that song, sometimes we don't realize what the words mean. But the words mean that serving Christ can be hard. Just think about all that the Apostle Paul went through as he traveled and he ministered. And as he tried to lead people like Agrippa. And as he tried to lead people like Felix and other people to Christ. What and all he went through. There were times when the Apostle Paul was beaten with rods. Could you imagine that? You're out spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and someone comes up to you and they don't like the message that you're preaching so they beat you with a rod. And then he was pelleted with stones. There were times when he was abandoned. There were times when he was shipwrecked. There were times when he was attacked by bandits of his own countrymen. And it was, he was attacked by bandits of Gentiles. But no matter what, he stayed the course. You see, no matter what we go through in this life, church family, no matter what we go through, we can make it if we stay rooted in that good soil of Jesus Christ. But we got to stay rooted in Christ. Okay? In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7, let's look at what the Scriptures say. 
There the Apostle Paul says, So then, just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted, rooted, notice that, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. You see, we're rooted in Christ when we refuse to give up. When we keep on preaching the word, when we keep on serving, when we keep on trusting God, when we keep on worshiping God through it all, and we do that knowing that the Christian life is hard, but heaven is worth it all. Amen? Heaven's worth it all. No matter what we go through in this life, heaven is our gain. For me to live is to live for Christ, but to die is gain. So the rocky heart condition is one who is not rooted in Christ like they need to be. And so trouble comes and they quickly fall away. So do you have the rocky heart condition? Do you have the pathway, that hard heart? Do you have the rocky heart condition? Or do you have the thorny heart condition? The thorny heart condition. Could you imagine that you have a a big crop to plant and you want this crop to produce? So would you take it and plant it amongst a bunch of thorns or a bunch of thorn bushes? No. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. Number one, you wouldn't want to stick your hands in there and get scraped up. And number two, the thorns would choke that plant to keep it from growing and to keep it from producing crops like we'd want it to do. But that's how that thorny heart condition is. The one with this thorny heart condition, they received the message of the Word of God. They were baptized into Christ, but their internal struggles choke them and keep them from being unfruitful. Keep them from being fruitful and makes them unfruitful. Jesus explains this back in our text there, Matthew 13 and verse 22, which says this, The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. Now listen to what happens to him. But the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it, making it unfruitful. Jesus is saying here that the person with the thorny heart condition gets so consumed with the things of this world to the point that it keeps them from being the servant of God that they need to be. A good example of this, I believe, is found in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus and all of his disciples come to the house of Mary and Martha. And I could just imagine this scene unfolding before my eyes. Jesus is at the door. All the disciples behind him, Jesus knocks on the door. And Martha opens the door. And she's like, well, hi. But then she starts to panic. Because, well, she has guests and she's not ready for guests. So Martha starts running around making sure everybody has something to drink, make sure everybody has something to eat, make sure everyone has what they need. But here is her sister Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, just listening to him teach. He comes in, sits down with his disciples, and she's sitting there listening to Jesus teach his disciples and teach her. And Martha looks over as she's making all these preparations and she gets mad. Ladies, would it make you mad if your sister wasn't helping you when you had all kinds of things to get done and you had a bunch of guests? Well, that's what's going on with Martha. So Martha gets mad and she rushes over to Jesus and she says, Lord, tell my sister to get up and help me. But Luke 10, verses 41 through 42, let's look at this response. There it says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things but only one thing is needed or indeed only one Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her you see Mary here in this excuse me Martha here in our text has a thorny heart moment she's all worried about the things of this world when she should have been sitting and learning at the master's feet why because when you sit and learn at the master's feet it will help you be all the more fruitful and it's so important that we're fruitful in the church that we're fruitful as Christians people with the thorny heart condition Allow the cares of the world, 
The deceitfulness of riches and the pleasures of life keep them from being the servants of God that they need to be. So I ask you, is Jesus describing you when he talks about the thorny heart condition? Are you a Christian who was once just so committed to serving like you should, but now the cares of the world are keeping you from serving like you should? Is Jesus describing you? Do you have the thorny heart condition? Do you have the pathway heart condition, that hard heart? The rocky heart condition? The thorny heart condition? Or do you have a good heart? A good Christian heart? heart you see jesus finishes up this parable of the heart conditions this parable of the sower on a positive note and he explains the good heart and the good heart is the one who receives the seed of the word of god is baptized into christ and does their best to be faithful all the way to the end why so that we can win more souls and make it to the glory land of heaven let's look at how jesus explains this and Matthew 13, in verse 23. There Jesus says, But the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word, understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. You know, if you have a good Christian heart, a committed Christian heart, and we all need to be committed to Christ above all, if we have a good Christian heart, then we will hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know that? We'll hunger and thirst to be gathered together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll hunger and thirst to study the Word of God. We'll hunger and thirst to evangelize. We'll hunger and thirst to bear more fruit for the Lord. So do you have that good Christian heart that's living the Christian life as you should. You see, we'll all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that, but we are to do our best to be people with good hearts, who have compassion for other people, who evangelize and who bear fruit. So do you have that good heart that Jesus is talking about in the parable of the sower? Now we're coming to the moral of the story. The moral of this parable. And the moral of the story is this. God wants us all to have good hearts. Ready to receive the word. To share the word. He wants us to have hearts that grow in the faith. So many Christians come to Christ. They're baptized into Christ and they fail to grow. But the Bible says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3, so a good heart will grow in the Lord and produce fruit. So again, I ask you, do you have the good Christian heart? Lost soul or strayed soul, let me ask you this. Has your heart been receptive to the Word of God today? Do you want all your sins washed away? Do you want to dwell in heaven for eternity with the Almighty God? If so, then you have to obey the one who spoke this parable. And that's Jesus Christ our Lord. And remember all that Jesus went through. You know, we partake of this meal every week of the bread and the cup. And we need to, when we partake of this meal, remember... Why we partake of this meal. And the reason we partake of this meal is because of what Jesus did for us. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And we need to be remembering him. So let's remember that to save us from our sins so that we could have forgiveness, so that we can have heaven ahead. Jesus went to the cross. He endured all this pain and agony, more pain than I could possibly describe to you. I mean, if you study Roman crucifixion, you see how horrific it is. Imagine having spikes pounded through your hands and through your feet, being suspended in the air, stripped of your clothing in humiliation after being beat half to death. That's what Jesus went through, and he hung there for six hours and died for our sins. So lost soul, my question is, will you obey Jesus Christ? 
Has your heart been receptive to His Word? The one who died and rose again. Well, if your heart's been receptive, then you'll live out what the Bible says. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost that after Peter preached that gospel message, that the people were cut to their heart. When they heard about Jesus and all that he went through to save us, they were cut to their hearts. Lost soul, does it cut you to your heart to know that Jesus hung on the cross for you and me? If so, you'll do what he says in his word. And his word tells us to be saved, to be forgiven, that we have to hear the word of God. We must receive that word of God. We must believe. We must repent of our sins. We must come forward and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We must be baptized into Christ and after that we need to be faithful. Even when it's hard, we need to be faithful to the point of death. And we'll receive that crown of eternal life. In the Old Testament, in Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26, the scriptures say this, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. All lost souls who have hard hearts, all strayed souls who have hard hearts, it is my prayer today that the Heavenly Father will remove the heart of stone from you and give you a heart of flesh that is receptive to the Word of God so that you obey Him before it's everlasting too late. Because one day, it will be too late. What will you do with Jesus? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we praise and worship your holy name. Your name above all names, Lord. Father, as we come before you, I pray For the people who have hard hearts, I pray that you give them a heart of flesh, Lord, so that they'll receive your word and obey you. I pray that you bless us Christians that have the good hearts that we need to have. Not the thorny heart or the the rocky heart, Father, but I pray that we will have a good heart that has your word and that sends your word out into this world by using us as your vessels. Again, Father, we pray for the lost. I pray that people will realize that they need you more than anything. That you, Father, are essential to every life to have salvation. Again, we thank you for Jesus. And we pray all this in Christ Jesus' name. And amen.